So I would be miss, remiss not to start with a little bit of a personal story and then I'm going to get into what I think is the most powerful use case of data that we have today. Of course I'm biased uh, based on my perspective. I was at a, a conference yesterday with about 350 CEOs and there happened to be maybe three women in the room. And so I know that my life's purpose is to inspire women and girls. I have been fortunate with an incredible story. I had 66 VC no's before I got my yes. I made it to 22 all partner meetings. I struggled, I had a lot of money in the bank and lost it all um, as I went through my process. And now today, seeing the incredible success that we've had, and it's all a journey and there is no end destination, I know that my purpose is to share my story so that I can inspire you women and for the men in the room to inspire your wives, your daughters, your sisters, your grandmothers for that matter, to roll your shoulders back and dream big too. So with that, now I'll go into what I believe to be the most powerful use case of data and how data can drive our world and our future today. If we think about what is the number one thing that we look for as businesses above all else, everyone is looking for pipeline, you're looking for revenue, and to grow your business. Imagine a world, close your eyes, and imagine a world where your data can find your next customer with an 86% accuracy rate. Imagine a world where you know what their needs are, where to find them, what they're interested in, their pain is, what competitor products that they might be researching. And so you can get into that sales cycle early and you can grow your business. And that's the world that we live today. And why is it available to us today? Why can we do these fundamental things that five, 10 years ago we couldn't do? I'm not gonna sit here and talk a lot about the technology behind Sixth Sense and what we're doing, but one, you guys all know this. We have technology and data in a way that we can get, we were just talking about here a few seconds ago. We can get any question to any answer, n-dimensional segmentation in a matter of seconds. We don't have to store things in cubes in an aggregate anymore. We can actually get at the raw nature of that data to answer those questions. Two, we live in this incredible digital world. We're all walking around with supercomputers in our pockets, right? I have four personal screens right now. It's not okay. I should get rid of a few of them, but I have my personal phone and my work phone and my iPad and my computer. And what are we doing when we leave this, when we're going on our screens? We're leaving a trace of exactly what we want and need. And if you think from a B2B marketing perspective, which is the buyer that we serve, they're trying to find when somebody's in market, for example, Cisco is a big customer of ours. They want to know when somebody's in market for networking solutions. They can sell to hundreds of millions of companies on the earth. Any company, SMB, mid-market, enterprise, they need to know when that their buyers have a pain and have a need. And the beauty for B2B is that the research that you're doing in a B2B environment, as you're going across these multiple screens and you have multiple buyers across these buying committees, they're leaving a far richer digital trade than anything B2C could even begin to imagine. So if you think today, when I'm getting ready to buy my red Ferragamo shoes, which I usually wear on stage, so I'm not wearing today, I go out and do research, they're about $750, I just submitted it. They're my favorite, I can walk down the New York streets for 10 miles and they won't hurt my feet, so I continue to buy them, but I continue to wear them out. But we also know that every B2C retailer, when I'm going out and doing that research, knows when I'm in market to buy those shoes, right? And they're hitting me with those ads. So for B2B companies, where there's 10 times more activity happening, when somebody's getting ready to buy $5 million of routers, they're leaving that rich digital trace. So the pain for B2B marketers is that they're no longer in control of the conversation. So if you think about even five years ago, I kind of go back 10 years ago, five years ago, whatever you want to call it, when somebody was getting ready to go make a purchase from Cisco, what was happening? They would think about, okay, I need new networking solutions, there's Juniper, there's Cisco, you know, there's a couple, there's, now there's Brocade, there's other options out there. When they're in the buying process, they would pick up the phone and call the rep, and that Rolodex wearing, Porsche driving sales rep would go and have the conversation. And it was a one-to-one -one conversation telling them about why their products are better, and really they'd probably take them to a nice fancy dinner and buy them a nice steak, and whoever bought the nicer steak and related better to their family might win the deal. That reality is no longer a reality in our world today. The last thing that buyers want to do is engage with a salesperson. The last thing that you want to do when you're buying something from a B2B perspective is download a form. Who wants to download a form and fill and get into a lead generation nurturing system? The entire premise of B2B marketing and lead generation is broken because it's based on something that buyers inherently are object to doing. They do not want to fill out these forms. 
And then we think it's even more complicated because the, the process isn't linear, right? So as they go, there are multiple buyers. Most of this activity is happening anonymously. They're going to social and they're going to your website and then they're going out to blogs and communities and trade publications and doing their research and listening to what other people are saying. So you can't just look at a linear path and think that's gonna help you predict. But again, as they're doing this, they're leaving this rich trace. And the beauty in the world that we live, in the data-driven world, and where predictive analytics and artificial intelligence all come together with machine learning, can actually look at those signals. We're processing 90 billion rows of behavioral signals to predict precisely when a company has a need for the products that our customers are selling. That rich digital footprint is telling us exactly what they want and need. Data knows us better than we know ourselves, and that's the world that we live, that we can go far beyond the bounds of what our human minds can begin to comprehend. That's what artificial intelligence is all about. I bring it back to one more pain point. And those of you who know a little bit about B2B marketing, you know, the, the efforts that go into this and the money that is spe spent to generate one crappy lead is ridiculous. They spend money, you do money on search, right? So you run search campaigns and you make sure you come up number one. You got SEO and SEM and you're coming up top on that list, right? You're, you're number one. Maybe when you're number one, 10% click to your website. You still don't have them, they're still anonymous. Then maybe from there, 10% download your white paper and register for your webinar, or do something and read the research and actually give you their information. Or you syndicate content, multi-billion dollar industry of content, B2B lead generation. Billions of white papers and download everything that's out there on trade publications. You're lucky if 1% get into your funnel. And I simply show this because all I'm suggesting here is if 1% are making it through, there have to be another 99%. Right, so that other 99% is out there and you can't see it. But marketers are trying so hard. They're spending money, whoopsie daisy, went too fast. Are spending so much money across all these ta tactics. You know, the Lumascape that'll show you all these, you know, there are 3,000 marketing technology vendors out there today. They're doing it and they're reaching, reaching their buyers. They just can't connect that data and then see where their buyers are in their journey, right? So everything is in silos. So everything they're doing, search here and they're running advertising campaigns here and then they have the digital teams here. These teams don't even talk to each other. But they're reaching the same buyer as they're going across these different silos and they don't know that these things are happening between. So, I, I, so basically, I was actually, well, before I get to kind of how it all works, I was, I was in a room with about 25 CMOs recently, and this was one of my most favorite moments. The question was asked, what was the number one thing that you would like, that you want to know of your prospects? The number one thing the CMOs answered was timing. I don't want to know who they are. I don't want to know that they look like other companies I've sold to before. I don't want to know the firmographics or their location. I don't even want to know who's in the company. I want to know, the CMO of Sears said, I want to know when someone's washing machine breaks so that I can call them, right? When I'm in market as a B2B SaaS company, I want to know when I'm getting ready to buy CRM and that next interaction is getting ready to happen. So the power of predictive is to tie all this data together, right? So to go back to the fundamentals of the data and the technology we have to bring all these silos and these channels together. Let's now talk a little bit about Sixth Sense. I didn't want to make this too pitchy, but basically we're tying together data from search outside of the preview of our customer's data. So when somebody's out there searching and they're searching for networking solutions for SMB, they go to trade publications, blogs, communities, forums, the tech targets, the IDG, the UBMs of the world, and they're doing their research outside of our customer's world. Then they get to their website, and they're anonymously interacting on their website. Then they fill out their form and get into marketing automation, and then they get to CRM. The beauty of the world of data today is that we can tie all this together. And we can tie it all together not only by the known entities of when somebody actually raises their hand and tells us who they are, but we can tie the anonymous data back to companies. So this is one fundamental advantage for B2B companies, is that we can tie things together, protecting PII, not going to the level of looking at personal information, but tying all this anonymous data and mapping it back to a company and saying, these companies are showing buying signals to be in market for the products that you're selling. So when we connect all that data, we then make predictions. And we predict where they are in the buying cycle against the products our customers are selling. So for Cisco, when somebody's in the awareness stage for routers, and then they're in the purchase stage for switches, for blue jeans, when somebody's getting ready to buy blue jeans or WebEx or another video conferencing tool, where are they in that purchase funnel so I can talk to them with the right message 
message at the right time. And then all these predictions can drive interactions. So the data kind of feeds itself. It's a, it's a circular loop. Where then now, when I go and run media execution against my trade publications, and I go run my search campaigns, and everything I do, if I know the needs of my buyers, I can talk to them with relevant messages at the right time, and the conversion rates will go up exponentially. I can personalize my website experience. So one of my favorite exp um, examples of this is click to chat So those of you who know how click to chat works, if you're a B2B company, you've tens of millions of visitors coming to your site and you pop up click to chat on everyone, it's gonna cost you way too much money. But if you pop it up when somebody's actually in a buying mode and they're actually ready to buy, it has incredible ROI. So that was one of the first things that we saw because you get somebody, you can take that chat agent in India and give them a targeted script to the product that they're interested in buying and the conversions will, will go, go through the roof. Then everything from an outbound perspective, all of your AEs and your sales teams are hunting these accounts. So instead of going out there arbitrarily coming up with territory lists, what are territory lists? Random, arbitrary assignments by some sales leader that has nothing to do with what your buyers need or want, right? So let's create territory lists based on our buyers and their needs. And then I kind of talk about, okay, we're, that's where we are now, right? So we can drive all these things, but what's the future? The future is tying all this together, right? So to look at when you spend on Forbes and you spend on Tech Target and you spend with your SEO, and I can look at the attribution across all of these things and not do backward-looking analytics, but do forward-looking and tell me the right message at the right time in the right channel and do that interaction for me. Take the humans out, which is really where we're going, right, with artificial and everything that we have today, and let the data drive the experience to have like what Inside Sales is doing and their, with their call down, their uh, contactability scores, they're the right voice or the right person that they're gonna, you're gonna talk to because you're more respect, receptive to pick up the phone at 4.30 a.m. and if a, a woman calls you that has an accent from you know, X country, you're more likely to be receptive to the messaging. So those kinds of things where the data is giving us these signals to be the most, to be the smartest that we possibly can in these engagements to drive sales. Um, the concept of leads are dead. And now I'm gonna to go to just a couple examples of some results. So Joseph Putasari, so Cisco is one of our marquee customers. They've been a customer of mine for about 14 years now. And we've been on a long journey together and I built this actually for them and then I spun out and spun out the Sixth Sense business. They've gone from a 5% marketing to sales conversion rate to 71%. They started with $2 billion in pipeline from Predictive to now $7 billion in pipeline. The opportunities that come through Predictive are five times greater the size because they're getting into the deal early. So what was previously a $10,000 opportunity size is now on average a $50,000 opportunity size. And one of their inside sales teams who can only call down 2,000 names a week, they were qualifying about $3 million in pipeline a week. Now they're qualifying about $10 million in pipeline. So this is their journey over time, and I'm looking at my times, so I'm gonna keep going. Mike Monsbach, this is one of my favorites, Blue Jeans. He was the head of sales at Citrix, moved over and took over as the president of Blue Jeans recently. He came in and said, we have 12 marketing technologies. What the heck? I am only going to keep those that can actually prove that they can grow pipeline and ROI, and that as I push down the gas, they continue to scale with me. So I was kind of nervous. I was like, all right, let's do this. Let's go through this whole proving exercise as we're going back, taking a step back. They found not only a 4X lift in their opportunities, but one of the really interesting things is the sales productivity. It usually took one in 33 touches for an inside salesperson to qualify a lead. Now it takes them one in 10 with the six cent scores. They had a three times greater opportunity size. So what used to be 10,000 is now almost 26 or $27,000 opportunity size. And then just in a very short amount of time without anything else in a month, they were able to come up with $8 million of incremental pipeline uh, by turning this on. So looking at those signals and for them and for companies that aren't first in their market, so people don't think blue jeans when they think video conferencing, this can have the biggest impact. If you are first, if people are gonna make it to you, then it can help you get an advance of that sales cycle. But really it's those, those companies who are trying, who have this great technology and people don't have the brand recognition and wanna find buyers when they're active as opposed to waiting for them to come forward. Um, Scott Broomfield was the, uh, he just left Exactly. he was the former CMO of Exactly. The quarter before they went public, 86% of their business came from our purchase stage predictions. So helping them find the accounts that we're gonna close. My favorite story of all, and I'll leave it, I'll leave it on this one, was the third largest deal in Exactly's history. Um, there's two types of scoring. There's what we call profile scoring, which is segmentation, look-alike modeling, that's what most predictive vendors in the market do. And that's basically firmographics of saying this company looks like somebody else you've sold to. We take a really strong stance, that's nice to know, and that can help you segment the right companies, but it's not helping you find 
find those people who actually have a need now. So we look at it as two knobs. You might want to turn one knob off and turn the other knob up. So we said turn off the profile scoring, just turn that down, and let's just find companies that are active and in market for sales compensation software, which is what they sell. And they found a company, Anheuser-Busch, never sold to a beer distribution company before. So it had been a very low profile fit because they've never sold to this kind of company before. It doesn't make any sense to them. Well, sure enough, they were in a sales cycle with their competitor and it turned into the third largest deal in the company's history, $1.7 million. So this is finding buyers when they have a pain, when they have a need, and the timing, and this is the power to me of what data affords us in our world of, of big data and predictive. Oh, I have one more. I thought I took this one out, but Jake from NetSuite, you know, he basically says that all the lists that they put, he's a sales operations person. We sold to marketing, and sales is now owning this. If you know anything about sales and marketing and big enterprise companies, they don't love each other. There is no love. And when marketing buys a technology and sales takes it over because they're so excited about it, there's nothing greater. And he basically, you know, he's going to be on stage with me in a couple weeks and says that we put all the other list buys and all the other leads to shame because we're really finding those companies that have a need now and all their conversion rates were at least 2x greater than what they had before. And that's it. Oh, sorry. I went a little over. So how does the uh, feedback loop work? So you have, you have a model and then um, I guess, so you need to train the model for each new customer. Um, and then how do, you, how do you get the data back as to whether the model worked or not? So we're real time syncing into their CRM, their marketing automation and their web data. And then we have our own network of search, publications, blogs, communities, forums that it's about 90 billion rows of activity data that's happening across the web. So we're tying all that together in real time. So we can see when we make a prediction and when an opportunity actually opens. So we can see it's actually self-learning over time to know if the actual models are working. So as we start to turn this on, it, it gets smarter and smarter and smarter over time. And you can um, attribute, so the, the, what's tricky about uh, B2B sales is that there's a sales cycle and yeah. during the sales cycle there's um, all sorts of things and factors um, Lots that, of that, factors. that can be. So how do you, how do you when, when you sell to your customers, how do you think about attribution and, and, and them making sure that they don't say, well, you know, that's my salesperson. That's not because you predicted, yep. right? That's actually a great, a great question. And so we take a firm stance that we're helping you find opportunities that are in market. We're not necessarily, there's, there's two stages. First, you want to find everyone that's in market, and then you want to close. From opportunity to close is a whole different set of predictive capabilities. And that's, you're starting to look at the, the reps and the messaging and how you're pro differentiating your product and if your product can stand up and compare. Our claim is that we're helping you find everyone that's in market. Now, whether you can sell to them or not, we're helping you find these opportunities. These are valid opportunities who are people who have a need for the products that you sell. That's the next stage. And there are other companies that kind of help you from opportunity to close. Eventually, we could get there. But we really think like the beginning of the funnel, finding those opportunities, looking at the universe of every company you could sell to, where should you focus your efforts, is where we kind of sit. Okay, great. Just one more question from me. And maybe to the inspirational part uh, that, that you mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Uh, tell us about your journey. How did you come to uh, be the founder of, of this great company? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, so I owned a services business for 14 years prior to Six Sense, um, aging myself. Yes. And so through that process, Cisco has been a customer now almost the whole time. They were one of my third customers early on. And for a long time, we were doing basically attribution analysis. We were, we were taking their web data with their marketing automation, with their CRM data, linking it up with DMB data, linking it to demand-based data, and helping to call center data, and helping them understand campaigns and everything that they were doing. And while it was a great lifestyle, profitable business, I had anywhere from five to 20 consultants and data scientists and engineers working for me, I didn't feel like I was moving the needle and helping them grow their business. We we're looking back on data, we we're patting ourselves on the shoulder, great, this campaign worked, but nothing was changing in their organization. They're paying us a lot of money, but nothing was really happening. So I had a thesis that instead of looking backward, can we look forward? Can we look at patterns of behavior of those people who have bought and then predict the future. Fast forward two and a half years, a lot of failure. So we tried we tried a lot of stuff. We tried a lot of that firmographic stuff that other companies are doing and yeah, it gave us a little lift but it just wasn't enough to get to like the CMO level or make an impact on the business. And it was there was a day when I was delivering results and it was clear as day to me. I was delivering to a VP at Cisco and she said, Amanda, do you know what you're doing? I said, yeah, we're 
predicting your sales? She said, no, you know our buyers are going to buy before they know they're going to buy. And then there's all this joking about sending people POs before they even know they're in a sales cycle. And while that's kind of funny, there was a bit of reality to it. And I was like, whoa, this is like, there is something here. There's something fundamental. And then I did it for a couple other customers, had the same success. Then I failed trying to raise money for a year and a half. Um, yes, that was not fun, but you know, I have more stories about that, have moments of realization that I just have to stick with this. I realized I had the wrong tech team behind me. I came together with my now co-founders. Um, they're a Y Combinator company, built the third largest instance of Hadoop in the world, a real-time predictive ad serving tool. When we came together, weeks later, we had term sheets. So again, it's all about the people and having all the right components, because we had market fit, but I didn't have the right technology team, and I didn't realize it at the time, and when I filled that hole and that gap, then it all happened, but I didn't know that. If I look, hindsight's 2020. Looking back, I didn't know that that's what I was missing and why I would get to the finish line so many times, because they would see something, oh, we have, wow, you have a multi-million dollar business that's you know, profitable, and great, this is market fit, we're going to give you money, and they're like, oh, wait, you don't have the right technology team. <laughs> great. Um, do we have questions? There's one right here. Uh, can you elaborate how you access the uh, search data? I cannot. <laughs> Thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say we don't claim to have all search data across the web. We have access to about 40%. Um, and how we do it is a huge competitive differentiation for us. Um, how we, we actually just recently announced a product called SearchSense. We just give you back accounts that are searching for your products, your competitors' products. Um, but yes, sorry. Good question. <laughs> One over there. Uh, do you serve the business lending companies or just more product suppliers? Um, business lending companies. Not currently, but if it's so, here's the criteria that we look at for companies that we would serve long sales cycles, highly considered, they're doing research online. If you're just trying to find other people that look like similar companies, and you know, if you're, then it's harder for us. Um, we we can do the profile stuff that other other companies do, but if people are doing research, they're searching, or they're going to blogs and communities and forums and trade publications, and they're looking at advisory research content, or they're going to your website and you don't know who they are, we can help you. Great. Those. I thought I saw another one. Right, right here. Can you elaborate a little bit more about how this differs for um, B2C and and why this type of organization maybe can't exist on a customer level due to regulation or anything to that capacity? Um, so, you know, it could work for B2C. B2C is a much shorter transactional sales cycle. So when I'm getting ready to buy shoes, I'm buying them and it's impulse, a lot of it's impulse buy. It's not a considered purchase. What we're really relying on and what our patent is all behind is that the idea that there's a lot of behavior over time. Right, so it's not just one interaction or one or two things, and it's not just saying, "Oh, she searched for this, so she was on looking at this, you know, coat, and so now I'm going to give her this coat." Or, you know, she bought baby clothes, so she now she needs baby books and things like that. It's kind of correlation analysis modeling, and for us, we're looking at a fundamentally different problem. The problem is these are long sales cycles in a lot of cases, and sometimes they're shorter sales cycles, but they're considered purchases, and most of the behavior is happening anonymously. Whereas when I'm shopping, I have given you my information because I bought shoes before. So in the whole shopping world, all the DMPs are matching cookies based on your email address and know a whole lot about me, right? And in the, B2, in the B2B world, that's in the B2C world, in the B2B world, we're not filling out forms. And that's the only thing we can do because we don't shop on, B2B doesn't shop online, right? So the closest thing they can do is get you to watch a webinar to give you their information and you become a lead and it's one person, but you don't sell to one person, you sell to 50 people. So the whole premise of lead scoring, predictive lead scoring is, is broken. The whole premise of trying to find that one person and one interaction and one lead is not how the sales cycle is actually happening. So it's just a different problem. It can work, at, you know, we're not trying to tie back all this data back to the PII because we're not trying to share personal information across, so the beauty of it is we can share all this data and it's not personal. So it, it makes it a lot easier for us with all this regulation stuff happening. All right, well, oh, one last one over there. 
So I understand you don't want to disclose how you do, if I get the search data, but can you tell us some other examples of data sources that you found useful? Yeah. Especially it seems successful with uh, web conferencing. So what, what other data than company profiles you found there? And yeah. how, how did you get the data and why is it useful? So a couple sources. One, I mean, inherently all the anonymous traffic that's happening on our own customer's website and in their marketing automation system, those things are useful. But outside of that, in the world that we're bringing to the table, so companies like Tech Target and IDG and Forbes, right? These big publishers that brands are spending tens of millions of dollars on right now. So I'm going to do a case study in two days with Forbes and Dell. And so the the story for them is, you know, there's I don't know the actual dollar amount. Let's just pretend it's ten million dollars, you know, a quarter or a month that they're spending, but right now they're just, prior to having something like this, Forbes is saying, I know I can reach your tech buyers. I know I can reach those right people. And Dell is saying, well, how do we know, like, prove it. They don't have a way to prove it, but if I can go to Dell's site and look at the buyers that they have and say, you know, you have 20,000 companies that are in market for storage right now across these areas of Forbes. That's a win for Dell. That's a win for Forbes because Dell's going to spend with Forbes. So that's why Forbes gives us their data. So it's I look at it as Stephen Covey is one of my, it's like my Bible. Win, 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 right? So a win for Forbes because they can build better advertising programs. A win for Dell because they're reaching their buyers. A win for us because we're bringing it, make, bringing it all together. Great. Uh, actually, we, 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 we out of time. But uh, so... Um, Actually, this brings um, a, a related point. We, we'll, uh, so right after, um, before I bring uh, the, the next speaker, we'll, uh, all the speakers will be uh, in that little lobby area, if you, if you don't mind, after oh, the, we will? Uh, not upstairs, <laughs> but right, right here. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, you know, due to building constraints, we'll, we'll have a bunch, of, we'll have water. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a great, great way to, uh, to connect uh, to the, with the speakers and connect among yourself. So um, right after the last talk, uh, we'll, again, we'll be right right up the stairs. Okay. Thank you. This Thank was you. great. Thank you.